Morning everybody, thank you very much for coming. Um, my name's Dinah Tickell, I'm the NAB's Chief Executive, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet me before, and thank you so much for giving up a short part of your morning to be part of the NAB's Working Parents Initiative. Now, as we are talking about working parents, we really felt that we ought to put children in the heart of this. Now, I'm not going to bring any children in today into the cinema, um, unless any of you have got any of yours with you, maybe, I don't know. Um, but what that does mean is you have to start with me. So are you ready? One, two, three. There we go. Anyway, to move it on quite quickly. So um, welcome everybody, as I've said. Um, but seriously, do thank you very much for coming for which I believe to be a really, really important issue. Um, alongside me today, I'm delighted to have um, NAB's new president, Karen Blackett, uh, chairwoman of Mediacom. Um, she's going to do the keynote speech and take you through the key findings from our report, which you've got with, on your um, seats. So take away that, please. I also have with us um, one of NAB's trustees, Pippa Glucklick, who's a CEO of Starcom MediaVest, and she's going to share the case study of Starcom and let you know how they managed to deal some of the challenges of working parents. We also have with us Lucy Barker, who's the head of people from Rufus Leonard, and we thought it'd be really useful to say how a smaller organisation met some of the challenges as well, because one of the issues that we do here is people say it's very easy for bigger organisations to do this, but smaller organisations with limited resources, they do struggle a bit more. So we wanted to bring some life to those case studies for you. So one of the things I wanted to say is I'm going to make no apology this morning for saying something that you may have heard me say before. Last year, NAB's calls from people who were dealing with emotional pressure and issues has gone up by 67%. And that is a massive issue. We are piling on the pressure on our people at the moment in our organisations. There's a lot of factors that are leading to that. But that led NABs to really think about how do we put wellbeing at the heart of our industry and NAB's new vision statement. Our new vision is to see a UK advertising and media industry that not only truly believes in the value of its people, but actually demonstrates that. Because if we don't look after our people, we will not continue to maintain the competitive advantage that we need to have in our businesses. And we really, really believe that we need to put well-being at the heart of our, everything that we do. Now, but with that came some responsibility. And we felt very strongly that NABs needed to do more itself. If we're going to have a vision that's about how we help the industry, we have to do more ourselves. And therefore, we are. But we also felt there was a unique opportunity to bring everybody together as the industry's support organisation with a fantastic network to say, what can we all do together? So in 2014, NABs launched its first Working Parents programme. Now, we've been running masterclasses and one-to-one -one coaching for a couple of years, but consistently the working parents still tell us that it's very, very difficult in organisations to balance that life between work and home. We sometimes call it balance, we sometimes call it blend, accepting that the two things merge very, very much. But what we've done now is we wanted to do more. So we've done a survey of nearly 600 um, parents and non-parents in our industry. We've done in-depth interviews with heads of talent across the business and with clients as well. Because one of the challenges that comes back is that people say it's clients that often put the demands on agencies and as agencies we can't respond to that. So we've spoken to clients as well. We thought that was only fair. We've also looked significantly at what other organisations are doing outside of our industry. So we can try and bring some practical examples that we can hopefully all take back to our working environments. And we've also looked at fathers. One of the challenges that came through is the issues often focuses on women and not dads. And one of the challenges, and I want to say thank you to McGarry Bowen for bringing this issue towards us, is dads want to have a bigger, bigger value in bringing up their children as well. And they want the flexibility to work alongside their partners quite often to balance this, this um, work life. And therefore we've started to do more work and understanding that blend of changing responsibilities for mothers and fathers. We hope this initiative will leave you inspired to go away and do more, have ideas that you can take back to your organisations. Um, and in return, NABS is updating its Working Parents programme to provide more services um, throughout the industry. I'm especially delighted today to have Karen with us as NABS new president to launch this Working Parents initiative. We want parents to be the best they can be at work and at home. The talent loss as working parents leave our industry makes no business sense whatsoever. And the impact on the individuals is significant. 
want to shine the spotlight on the issues. We can't pretend it's solved and we know it's difficult, so we want to be practical and offer as many ideas as we can. But I believe we can do this as an industry if we work together. So I'm delighted today that we've come together on this very, very important issue. So are you ready again? One, two, three. Karen Black here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, good morning everyone. I am delighted to be here and delighted to be here as the president of NABS because this is an area that I absolutely 100% believe in and I love this industry and want this industry to continue being a beacon across the world for what we do and the advertising industry. Um, I know a number of you here today, but for those of you that don't know me, I always like to present and include a little bit of audience participation. <laughs> a, to just make sure that you're all awake, um, but B, just to make sure that some of the points that I make are, are getting across. So I'm going to start with a little bit of audience participation, if you don't mind. Um, if you are a working parent, could you please stand up? If you believe you are better at your job now than you were 10 years ago, could you please stay standing up? Good, no one sat down, that's a good start. <laughs> so I think, you can all sit down now. So I think that's pretty clear that it is really important for us to make sure we keep working parents in because there is a lot of talent in this room. So um, I entered uh, the media industry in the early 90s. Actually, I was trying to be a backup uh, singer for Pepsi and Shirley, but that didn't work <laughs> out. So uh, I entered the industry in the early 90s, and that's me as I entered the industry in the early 90s. And that is what the industry looked like in the early 90s in terms of the movers and shakers, both agency side and sort of media owner side. Almost all men and I don't want to be presumptuous, but I am certain that a high proportion of them had wives who no longer had their own full-time career um, and were no longer employed for a living. That creates a standard and that creates a benchmark. If we fast forward to now, this is what the industry looks like. Far more beautiful, I think, <laughs> we can all agree. And we have 30.5% of uh, the ad industry being led by senior women. And we are doing, and I know we beat ourselves up about it, but it should be better, it should be 50-50, but we are doing significantly better than other industries, such as the legal profession law, where only 18.8% of the senior industry figures in the law profession are women. What is absolutely clear is that the tone and culture set by senior management team plays a significant role in determining the experience of working parents. Today, the makeup of the modern family has changed. So according to a report by IPPR Think Tank, 88% of families were working in 2014, the highest proportion since records began in 1996, and dual earner households are now the norm. More than two thirds, that's 68% of couple households had both parents in work. A third of Britain's working mothers are the main income earners now. And 1.9 million families in the UK consist of single parent and single parent families with dependent children, such as myself. So it seems to me really, really obvious that the cultures of our organisations need to change to ensure that we keep talent in and hence working parents in the industry. Yet, according to the NAB's Working Parents Survey, one third, so 32% of the parents in the report, reported that being made to feel uncomfortable about, being, uh, about their parenting responsibilities at work so that's a third of people feeling uncomfortable about being a parent and it's somehow clashing with their role at work. And the numbers are quite worrying, they really are. Uh, as Diana already said, the NAB's advice line saw a 67% increase in calls from people needing emotional support. The IPA figure for churn amongst agency staff averages 30%. 
That's estimated to cost our industry £184 million a year, and the average across British industry is 20%. The Working Parents Survey revealed that 60% of parents or someone they know had felt compelled to leave their job because of the pressures that come from being a working parent in our industry. And the last stat really does concern me. 55% of women who are not yet mothers believe becoming a mother obstructs your chance of promotion, which is a real concern. And I think some of this is expressed in some of the quotes that you will see in the report. So this one, um, obviously, is, is about the culture that we have in our industry. And the next one uh, is about whether or not you can have it all, whether or not you can be a parent and work in this industry. And this may go some way in explaining why the majority of employees in the industry are aged between 25 and 34, with only 12% aged 45 and over. Seeing as I'm 45 this year, I'm slightly worried where I'm going. <laughs> but importantly, there is so much evidence and statistics out there about the importance of diversity in creating successful businesses and profit profitability to our businesses. The McKinsey report talks about the increase that happens when you have more gender balanced teams working within any organisation. So that 15% more likely to outperform those with less gender diversity. So there are clear business cases to make sure that we look at how we can keep working parents in and how we can ensure that we have the most diverse and inclusive cultures in our organisation. If we improve the well-being of employee, employees, it does result in happier, healthier and a more productive workforce. It does offer a financial advantage for businesses. It does ensure that it's a competitive advantage over other organisations which don't focus on this area. It does help us retain talent, which means that we have a reduction in churn, and things like absenteeism tends to be reduced. So creating a more diverse workforce, which is representative of the audience, which we're all trying to talk to as a communication industry, is really important. So I want to introduce you to one of my KPIs. So I am a single mum of a six-year-old, and Isaac, he is actually one of my KPIs at the organisation because I want to be as good a chairman uh, in the office as I am a mum at home. So making sure that I manage my work-life blend is really important. The sense that we feel in terms of working parents and guilt uh, when we have to stay at the office, guilt that we're not there with our kids is, I think, prevalent in all of our working lives. So making sure one of my KPIs is actually doing things which allows me to be a good parent is something which I have as my KPI, but also think, uh, something that I encourage in the agency as well. So um, being a good role model, so that figure that 55% of women who aren't yet parents feel that becoming a mother can uh, be some sort of tripwire to your career is does really concern me so being a good role mother to both a role model to Isaac but also to women in the agency I feel is incredibly important I want Isaac to see me enjoying my work because I love my work but I also want people in the agency to see that I do care and talk about my children it is not something that I hide or that I try to cover so, um, I had brilliant female role models when I was coming up in the industry and they helped guide me and focus me on how to progress at work, but also ensure I have time to raise this young man. So, at uh, Mediacom we have always celebrated uh, family, so we've always had a kids Christmas party for the staff in the agency. <laughs> But when I became CEO of the agency, I needed to think about how I was going to work and the culture that I wanted to affect at the agency. So I brought in family days um, at the agency for our clients and our staff. So at Easter and in the summer, creating family events where you can have a day guilt-free at an event such as uh, an Easter egg hunt at Regent's Park, Legoland um, in Windsor, where you can spend time with your kids as a client, because they are parents as well, along with ourselves without that guilt, because we all want to spend time with our family. 
So I am a busy working mum. My calendar is quite ridiculous, so I'm just going to get on with it and tell you what the, uh, the findings of the survey are. So these are the four core recommendations um, from the survey in terms of what we should do as industry leaders and practitioners in the business. First of all, adopting flexible working practices, actually making sure that we train our managers and leadership teams in how to work with working parents, acknowledging what the changing role of parents are. So if you look at that first slide of the industry in the early 90s and the industry now, where we do have both parents now working, acknowledging what that changing roles mean, and then making sure that we do introduce those culture changing initiatives to make sure that we create communities within our organisation. So if I look at the first recommendation, first of all, um, we ha have um, some great examples from other organisations, as Diana said, that we can sort of all learn from. Um, Vodafone carried out some research um, amongst 8,000 employee employers and employees of organisations of varying size uh, that have introduced flexible working policies. Uh, with those policies introduced, they have seen 83% improvement in, productiv in productivity. 58% believe that flexible working policies had a positive impact on their organisation's reputation. The 2014 Future of Work report, 92% of Generation Y, so those born in the 80s and 90s, don't know if there's any of those here, um, identified flexibility as a top priority when selecting a workplace. Of course, compensation and money is important, but it is not the only criteria. Flexibility is absolutely important. But our NAVS research reveals that only 16% of respondents are actually working flexibly in our industry. So we need to ensure that we embrace changing technologies, management styles and work practices to find ways of making flexible working a mutually beneficial reality with our within our businesses. There are a number of barriers that were quoted within the survey as to why this doesn't happen. Diana mentioned already the lack of client acceptance being one of them. Now I do believe that it's down to us as industry leaders to have those difficult conversations. I have been in a position myself where I've had a client complain about one of my business directors working four days a week and how it wasn't possible for her to work on the account four days a week. And it's a difficult conversation, but it's a simple conversation. Do you want the best talent in the agency working on your business? And I can assure you that her four days a week is actually probably six days a week. So it's those difficult conversations we have to front up to. Lack of trust. Um, I often see people in meetings when they talk about somebody working from home going there working from home. <laughs> so it's that lack of trust that people are actually working from home. I know how productive I am when I'm able to work from home and I do work four days in the office and one day flexibly. I know how much I get done in that one day when I'm not in the office. Lack of resource in terms of what happens at the agency if people are working flexibly. But I think about cr creating hard business metrics to actually measure working flexibly is what's really needed. And this is something which BT introduced to make sure that they can measure how successful flexible working is. Uh, they saw absenteeism reduced by 63%, a 20% reduction in churn of flexible working employees, reduction in HR costs of 3 million in flexible working employees, Retention rate following maternity leave was 99%, which had a saving of 7.4 million a year, reduced carbon footprint and greater productivity. There are other great examples which uh, Lucy from Rufus Leonard will take us through about home working across the company and how it's incorporated into sort of staff job descriptions. So there are proven case studies there and it's something that we really do need to lean into. So the second recommendation, which is about training our managers and leadership teams. So based on the number of working parents in this room, I think we all believe that whether we are a parent or not yet, that working mums and dads provide an incredibly valuable and important contribution to the industry. But only 6% of those surveyed in the NAB survey 
had received any type of training focused on how to support their expecting, expectant and working parents. Unfortunately, you will see in the report that there are incidences quoted by res respondents where a question that came up in an interview asking, do you plan on starting a family? It was clear that this was not a positive thing. Apart from the fact that it goes directly against equality laws in the UK and is particularly discriminatory, the organisation could be missing out on hiring talent because of the person's gender and life stage. A recent survey by recruitment agency Glassdoor revealed that one in five women said their employer treated them differently after telling them about a pregnancy. There are two important stages, um, professionally and per personally, in our lives. Uh, being promoted into a managerial role where you're managing a team of people for the first time and having your first child. Both are absolutely life-changing and we have a responsibility as leaders of organisations to support people through those life changes. It is incredibly important and we need line managers and leaders to better understand and manage parents within their teams, recognise the value that parents can bring in and minimise that staff turnover. So in my own organisation, um, I did notice um, the lights going out on some of our, in the eyes of some of our mums who returned to work, worrying how they are actually going to manage having a family, being a mum, being a dad and managing client responsibilities. So we introduced a programme at the agency called Project Blend. I actually banned the word like work-life balance at the agency because it makes it sound as though there's a winner and a loser, but actually it's all about how your life blends. And it promotes open and honest conversations between a manager and their employee. It's all tracked via an app. And via that app, you have KPIs, which is why one of my KPIs is about being a good mum to Isaac, which is tracked on the conversations that I have with my manager. Other organisations outside of our industry have great examples. So National Grid hold workshops for new and expectant dads, because again, I also saw a strange thing happen to new dads in our agency, where there was this sudden obsession about progressing as quickly as possible and being promoted as possible. And it's just calm down, take it easy. So workshops for dads, National Grid do, but also building a company-wide network of dads as well is something that National Grid do, which is fantastic. The third recommendation, which is about that changing roles of mums and dads, this isn't just about mums, it is about parents, so it is about fathers as well. So the findings aren't solely focused about working mums in the industry. Fathers are also seeking to take advantage of flexible working. As one survey respondent eloquently put it, at a really fundamental level, there is a reality that families now mostly consist of two working parents. Let's not assume that it is the wife who will sacrifice her career. So money, of course, is important when deciding about a role, but it's not the only driver now, as I said. This is reflected in a 2014 survey of high-skilled working fathers in which 95% cited flexible working policies, ones that allows them to actively engage with their children as an important job characteristic. The NAB's Working Parents Survey revealed that 58% of parents regularly interrupt their time at home to deal with work. One in six parents worked more than 10 additional hours a week. Whilst working regularly at home tends to feature in the lives of our respondents, almost half of the parents said that they have never or rarely needed to address family-related issues during work hours. The perception of working parents is the, in the workplace is unfortunately very different. Some research conducted by Opportunity Now reveals that younger workers without children feel that they are expected to do more than parents in the workplace. This causes tension in the workplace with feelings of resentment from those without children and guilt with those parents who do have children, which negatively affects culture. There seems to be a uh, fatherhood bonus, which was identified by a sociology professor, professor, I can't say that, but a motherhood penalty. 
employers seem to consider fathers as more stable and committed to their work as they had a family to provide for. In contrast, women are seen as working less hard and being more distractible. There is evidence showing that men's earnings increase more than 6% when they have children. Uh, but on the contrast, where women's decreased 4% for each child that they had. So that could go some way in explaining why there is a gender pay gap in the UK. And I have witnessed it myself during my career. Um, hearing a male leader describing a female employee, employee having unfortunately fallen pregnant, as though she fell on some stick. Um, <laughs> And uh, yet the jubilation, in contrast, at a male peer starting a family meant he was a man now on a mission to provide and was locked in. All of us should be striving to create a culture where you can truly bring your whole self to work and not cover our identities. Hence. In our organisations, we need to research the cultural and generational changes in parenting within our businesses. Mothers are choosing to work more and fathers choose to become more involved in parenting. These changes should affect policies and practices within our own organisations. So creating communities, finding those role models can help transform company culture. We have some really good examples, and I have to big up the digital uh, brands here in terms of some of the policies that do exist. So I was privileged yesterday to be at an event where we heard Carolyn Everson from Facebook talk about the importance of well-being at Facebook. And at Facebook, that actually exists and is backed up by the policies that they have. So uh, maternity leave, uh, 52 weeks of which 26 weeks is paid at full salary and on target bonus, paid baby leave for dads, four months, full pay and bonus at target. And I think Mark Zuckerberg taking that four months paternity leave sets an example for the rest of the organisation. Adoption support, so financial assistance towards the cost related to adoption. Surrogacy support, financial assistance towards the cost related to surrogacy. Childcare support, so two and a half thousand pounds cash allowance per annum towards childcare costs. So I think incredible examples being set by some of the digital media owners. Another example, Johnson & Johnson, which I love, um, they give new parents an additional seven weeks, it could be con separate or consecutive, uh, seven weeks of paid leave during the first year of the child's birth or adoption because we know as parents that first child and when you have a newborn child, things can go wrong and suddenly you have to make sure that you sort things out so I think that's a brilliant example. So those are the recommendations. Um, the last one making sure that those changes and the culture that we introduce actually rings through. It's I don't think this is something that we should leave to our HR and people teams. It has to come from senior management within the organisation and it has to be led by us because <laughs> only if it's led by us will that cultural change really absolutely happen and exist. So that is it from me. I'm handing back to Diana um, who I think has now got another beautiful baby photo uh, <laughs> to introduce. So back to Diana. So one of the things we really wanted to do is make sure we made this as practical as possible. Um, and lots of organisations in the report when we produced and did all the survey are doing so much already. And we want to celebrate good practice and share that practice. Um, we were particularly interested in how many initiatives Starcom Media Vest had introduced um, to support working parents and flexible working generally. And um, I'm really, really want, delighted to have with us um, Pippa, Starcom's uh, CEO, and also NAB's trustee. So are you ready for one more picture? <laughs> one, two, three. Pippa, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Diana. I'm hoping the fact that that's a very grainy photo is not showing my age, but I suspect it probably is. Um, so thank you so much. It's my great privilege to be here um, on behalf of Starcom, but also uh, as a NUBS trustee, um, uh, which is an organisation which um, I think is fantastic, sits at the centre of our industry. So 
Uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit, as Diana said, about what we've done at Starcom. And I should say, first of all, I can take no credit for it whatsoever. Um, I've only been there three years, and a lot of the initiatives that were kicked off was some time before I joined, um, but I'm very, very proud to lead an organisation that has put a lot of these things in place. So I want to just tell you a little bit, oh, that's better, um, about us. So we're part of the Publicis Group. In fact, we're the largest media network as, as part of the group, which people often think is anything, but that's not true. Um, <laughs> just get that in there. Um, <laughs> although we're all one big happy family, <laughs> of course. Um, we're absolutely privileged to work with a number of fantastic brands. Uh, some of them are up there, and many of them are very focused. Their core audience, Procter & Gamble, of course, their core audience is parents, is, is very, you know, the P&G mums. Um, we're a team of about 600, so we're a pretty large business. Um, in fact, we're 58% female, um, so, so, you know, pretty well dominated, and certainly at a leadership level, um, we, we, we hold our own at the female end. Um, and to about 25% of us are parents, actually. So, question, why does that matter? Well, actually, it doesn't really. I, I sort of put that up there to show you, yes, we're a big organisation and we're part of a very big group, but that doesn't matter. None of this is about size or scale or numbers. It's all about talent. And as Diana said, and, and as Karen's talked about, that's all we have in our industry. We don't make anything. We don't produce any widgets. All we have is our ideas, which come from us, from our talent. And so making sure that the well-being of our talent, that they thrive, that their well-being is absolutely at the heart of what we do is the most important thing that we can all do within our own organisations, whether we're big or, or small. So I'm just going to take you back to 2010, and this has been uh, mentioned earlier actually, to the Future of Work study, which the IPA commissioned in, in 2010. And that wasn't particularly about parents, it was about millennials really, and, and the future of work and how people build their careers. Parents featured as part of it, but how they manage clients and so on. And, and Liz Nottingham, who's the head of our talent, um, sitting over there this morning, so she should really be up here talking about this, not me. Um, she had a, a light bulb moment. She was really, really heavily involved in driving that study and sat in on some focus groups. And as an organisation, we were doing, you know, bits and pieces around parents, and, and obviously it was a, it was a percentage of our of our uh, team, but it was it was a little bit sporadic. I think it's fair to say. And and Liz sat in a focus group and thought, if we don't do something about this and make this more front and centre of our organisation and make it sustainable, then something's going to go wrong and we're not really looking to the future and how we protect our talent that's so important to us. So, what did, what did we do? What did Liz do when she got back to the agency? Um, as has been touched on already, buy-in from top to bottom is absolutely critical. So the leadership team at the top of the organisation needs to realise that this is important. But ultimately it has to come from the people there. They have to buy into it, they have to want to make it part of the organisation that they work for. Um, and really it has to come from them because it's for them. So being good media types, what did we do? We set ourselves some benchmarks, we set some numbers. What did we think good looked like? What did, how did we know if we'd get there? And in fact, if we ever would get there, and, and actually I don't think we ever will, we have to keep learning and changing. Um, but we set ourselves some, some ambitions about what we thought we would want to achieve in this space. Um, we asked the experts. We knew we didn't have all the answers ourselves. So a few organisations that Liz particularly spoke to were working families who'd been a partner for in the uh, Future of Work research that IPA commissioned, Parents Matter, another charity who helped define best practice and policies in this space, and the Parent Practice who are trainers and, and, and lead in terms of um, you know, real L&D around this. So we talked to them about what's the zeitgeist in this space, what are people talking about, what matters, and, and just pick their brains really. And I'd encourage you to do the same, because there's so much information out there. Um, and last, but by no means least, probably the most important thing we did um, was to make it authentic. We had to make it real for the Starcom family, because we are a family. And our purpose as an organisation is the human experience company, so we had to make it true to them. Um, for us, and being a parent is just another job, and so helping them, our, our team, shape their experience as parents to make them better people outside the organisation, which would then reflect back inwards, was absolutely critical. 
So here's just a few things of the things we did. And we tried some stuff and some of it worked and some of it didn't. But here's some of the kind of standout uh, ones that I think I'd like to share with you. So first of all, I, I mentioned these people earlier, the parent practice. Um, so we thought we, we hired them in. And we were, I think, one of the first organisations, certainly in our industry, to run parent, uh, parent skills workshops. And we still do today, actually. I'm just going to read you a quote from one of the mums that attended it, which I think really says it all. Being a mum and working parent, there is hardly any time to inform yourself about parenting skills, so I really appreciate the parenting advice workshops. They align with the style I'd like to treat and raise my child and are a good reminder of how to get the best out of your child, which automatically helps being more focused at work because there's less to worry about on the home front if you get it right. Um, and I, I think, again, uh, we've, we've done some, some initiatives internally where people have shared their experiences of, of those parent skills uh, workshops and they've really worked. Mumsnet. Everybody knows Mumsnet, right? The largest online blogging community in the UK. Um, now, the name slightly defies, actually. They talk quite a lot about that for parents, not just for mums, and grandparents, actually. Um, and they had some awards, which they set up a few years ago, about family-friendly organisations. So one of our KPIs was, to, well, how do you get to be a part of that? And in 2011, so the year after the Future of Work study, we got silver. And then every year successively since then, we've got gold. It is a UK-wide um, award, so not just for our industry. And uh, I think it's a survey, so you have to qualify. It's not just, you can't just ask for it. And it's really important to us that we have it. I personally feel hugely proud to work for an organisation that has this. And it's had other benefits that I don't think we probably thought about when we set out to get it at the beginning, which is, for those of you involved in new business, when you fill in RFIs and you talk about your CSR policies, it's a great thing to be able to talk about, particularly with larger global clients, for whom the well-being of their staff and understanding their customers is really important, Procter & Gamble, as I mentioned earlier. Back to business ship, um, another fantastic scheme which we've been running for a couple of years, and all credit really for Liz and, and Sarah Taylor, um, who's, who's sitting there as well here this morning, deserve the credit for this. Um, so Diana touched on this earlier. What happens to all the brilliant talent that go on maternity leave or paternity leave and maybe don't want to come back? How do we make sure that they aren't lost to us as an industry? So what we did a couple of years ago is we set up a, a four-week training programme, a couple of days a week, really to help people coming back to work who'd been out of the industry for five years or more with their confidence to get it back up to speed and to stay relevant because our industry changes so fast. Um, in the last couple of years, we've, we've put 40 people through it. It doesn't sound that many, but it's really helped those 40 people. They've all been women, actually, sadly. We've had very, very few men apply to it, and we'd love to have some men apply for it. So, you know, please spread the word. Um, it's now being talked about by the AP IPA. It's been picked up by a government select committee run by Maria Miller. Um, and there's also a placement programme, a bit like an internship being run by F1 Recruitment. So you can all, all your businesses can, can get involved. And one of the things about that is it's to help people coming back to work to road test. Are they ready, actually? And then if they are and they work out well, then they might get a job out of it. So it's a win-win for everybody. And last but by no means least, this is quite an obvious thing to say, but we made it a real core cool part of our L&D programme. Um, it, obviously that counts towards people CPD, but we really made it kind of front and centre for those that 25% of the organisation. Uh, one of the things we did was a lot of webinars, for example, around developing personal resi uh, resilience, creating optimum sleep. We had sleep doctors in. And the webinars was really this thing around men and dads because they want to learn and know these things in different ways. They quite often don't want to sit in a, in a training um, meeting or training group and talk about it. So we learnt about that. We've run training for our managers about how to work with people in their teams who are either coming back from maternity or paternity leave or just become a parent so that they understand the pressures and the challenges that that parent is particularly facing. And we've made it a big part of our social fabric. So like Karen said, we have Halloween parties, uh, we do kids' passes and discounts and so on and so forth. So it's become a really important thing. And I think that stat of 25%, I think we, we're more parents now because we're a family-friendly organisation and we've attracted parents. So what, what we learn and what we're learning, well, this is pretty obvious and, and I think it 
fantastic that NABs have, have really shone a light on this for us all this morning. There's some great practical advice in the research which we can all do within our businesses. I think the first thing I'd say is really ask and listen. We're keeping learning at the moment we're undertaking. What does flexibility mean at our organisation? We have a very flexible policy, but we need we feel like we need to update it. Um, and we're testing some stuff and we're learning and we, we're engaging. So 10%, we've got 10% of our staff helping us define what that means from all levels, all backgrounds, whether parents or not parents. What does that mean to them? So that, as I said, it's for them, but it's also from them. Um, and keeping it simple, some really obvious stuff you can do. So we never have, we try not to have our company meetings on a, a Friday because people that work flexibly, quite often Friday is the day they're not there. So we, we try and do them on a Wednesday so that everybody can be involved. We try not to do too many networking events after 5.30. Sort of obvious things like that. Be open-minded. So going back to uh, Karen's example of the client that said, I can't have anyone that could work four days a week. We've, we've never turned, we're proud and delighted to say we've never turned down a flexible working request from someone that's come back from maternity leave um, because we've always found a way. We even had somebody that worked one day a week um, because they were of enough value to, to the organisation. So just be open-minded, think differently. Don't forget dads, this has been touched on already, but I think probably Liz would say that's been the hardest community for us to really engage with and, and maybe that's a cultural thing about how many you know react to this sort of stuff but we've really had to learn to work hard at engaging men and listening and talking to them in different ways um, so I'd, I'd really encourage you to think about them and, and hear to that from them on a one-to-one -one basis have no shame um, so uh, and I really truly mean this uh, use the industry whatever size of business you are there's so much stuff out there there's lots of blogs F1 recruitment do that there's lots of stuff in the research so steal some ideas borrow them adapt them so that they're culturally relevant and authentic to your business but a good idea is a good idea um, and last but of course not least keep iterating we're doing this all the time keep moving the needs and the pressures of your workforce will change and the industry will change so just make sure you stay relevant thank you I think what's really important for me is that steel with pride please please do take away the ideas and the ideas in the report for your for your own organizations and therefore we can help share this and raise as many standards as we can for working parents one of the challenges that i think is fair with our um, research is it it's very easy to say oh it's all right for some of the big digital organizations to do all these extended parental leaves there is a cost to that um, but what we wanted to do was just invite one organisation that works with NABs quite closely to just talk about their experience as a smaller organisation and how culturally you can make um, quite a significant difference. Now, I'm delighted to welcome Lucy Parker, who's their Head of People from um, Rufus Leonard. And your final picture of the day, one, two, three, oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely not you, Lucy. Oh, I don't know quite know what's happened there. One more. <laughs> there we go. Bad timing. <laughs> there we go, Lucy. <laughs> Absolutely dreadful. <laughs> okay, I will do that then in that case. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much to Diana and, of course, to Karen and Pippa. Um, I work for uh, Rufus Leonard, and I've just noticed all my notes are completely out of order here. Hold on a sec. Um, and... In fact, I'm missing a bit, but anyway, okay, freestyle it. Um, uh, so uh, we're a business that um, works with our clients to communicate uh, across loads of different channels, and some of our clients are people like Lloyd's, uh, British Gas, and the AA. Um, we employ 110 staff, and on top of that, we've got freelancers too. And we've got a really quite even split of male-female in our organisation. Um, we know that working in this industry, and everybody's talked about this this morning, the challenges working in an agency uh, in terms of briefing, in terms of pitching, in terms of team collaboration, a real challenge. So it's perhaps no surprise that in our industry it's really difficult to make flexible working work. But at Rufus, we always had a pretty grown-up attitude to the way that we've approached flexible working. And we've had initiatives over the years 
that have been things that we call TRIF, thank Rufus, it's Friday, um, which is in the summer months we let staff have the afternoon off. And these things have gone a long way to demonstrating to our staff that we've got a flexible approach, but we wanted to do less ad hoc and have a bit more structure in our organisation <coughs> and also create some role models to exemplify how flexible working can work, not just in our business but also in our industry. Um, we decided to pilot a scheme uh, with our staff over the past 12 months to see how we might improve things. Um, a year ago we had 20% of our workforce working flexibly and now I'm pleased to say it's 60%. So the research that we've, uh, we'll, you'll all see if you read the white paper that you've been given today, is really comprehensive and it's no surprise that, and it's, it's obvious that staff who uh, are, that, that have a good work-life blend, rather than balance, um, are far more engaged and loyal and likely to stay with you. And, and again, as, as the other speakers have touched on today, the cost associated with uh, replacing valuable staff can be measured not just in money but also in the relationships that you have with your clients. Um, also another stat that's been um, quoted today is that we know that a huge proportion of Generation Y are making their workplace choices based on flexibility and it's not just about remuneration any longer. So at Rufus we notice, particularly over the last two or three years, that we'd had a growing number of requests to work flexibly. And I should point out, these haven't just come from working parents. It's been across the business. I myself work flexibly. I don't have children, but I think it, I've been um, helping the business understand that it, it can be done and you can achieve a great deal. We did, of course, risk losing valuable staff if we weren't responsive to their request for flexible working. So we knew that it was something that we had to do more of. Okay, bear with, bear with. Okay, uh, so um, I decided to start off by doing a staff survey. And the purpose of that was really to understand what our staff thought about flexible working, whether or not they thought it was for them, um, and also to understand what their definition of flexible working is, because it can mean so many different things. Um, our staff told us that the, most, the type of flexible working that they would most benefit from was working from home. That was the, the most popular type of uh, flexible working for our business anyway. But also um, people wanting to have a change in their working hours, so just an earlier start and a, an earlier finish. Um, and again, these are sometimes it's, it's working parents making these requests, but it's also staff who, who aren't parents, who've got other commitments perhaps, and a bit of flexibility to help them. And there are of course some people that are just dreadful morning people, so if we cut them some slack, uh, <laughs> we're doing everyone a favour. Um, what I thought was really interesting from our staff survey is that 40% of our staff said that they weren't interested in flexible working. And I think that's an important figure to remember because not everybody wants to work in this way. And you do need to also engage in that group of people to get them to buy in to those people that are working flexibly. And that was one of the challenges that we faced. So the staff were telling us that the barriers they perceived to flexible working was certainly that their manager would be reluctant to agree to their request, that the collaboration required in an agency life would be negatively impacted and also as I said that other staff might perceive their lack of visibility as a lack of input and engagement with the projects they were working on. But amongst the biggest sceptics were my leadership team and um, I was talking to our chief uh, operating officer last night about this and he said I think you've been way too easy on us in this presentation because we were absolute dinosaurs in terms of our approach and, and really it's absolutely extraordinary what's happened in our business particularly over the last couple of years in terms of their changing attitudes and the reason the attitudes have changed is really because I felt it was important to do an education piece with that group in particular um, I had to really engage with the group that were the non-believers and there were clear knowledge gaps in um, their minds around how we needed to respond to the growing number, not only of requests for flexible working, but the growing number of parents in our organisation. 
Two years ago, there were 20% of our workforce were working parents, and now it's 40%. And for a business of our size, that, as you can imagine, is, is quite a challenge. But going back to Pippa's point, it doesn't really matter how big or small you are, this is an issue for all of us. So I knew that I needed to help our managers understand the challenge of parenting and working. Um, and again, everybody has mentioned this this morning, but the guilt factor that working parents have of leaving their child in the morning, but then that, that work guilt at the end of the day where they're perhaps having to leave their team mid-pitch or mid-presentation run through to go back to their child. So I had quite a job to do to explain to parents, excuse me, to our managers of those sorts of challenges. So our managers needed also to have a different perspective around the ways of working. There was an idea that because we'd always worked in one way, that's the way that we had to work forever going forward. A simple example being, if you have a phone call with somebody as opposed to having a meeting with them, you can guarantee that phone call is probably gonna last about five minutes. Face-to-face -face meeting, for whatever reason, take three, four, five times longer than that. Just a small little change. Um, I think also that managers, I had to allay their fears about this um, sense that they had a lack of control and how will I know what they're doing and how about the quality of the work they're producing. What's happened is that people are far more time efficient and actually because they've got fewer distractions going on, the quality of the work is in some cases far better than it would be if they were actually in the studio. But also, I needed to explain to uh, our managers and get them to buy into it that there were really clear, good reasons why people were asking for flexible working. And we also wanted managers to understand that there are benefits not just for the parents or those asking, but also massive benefits for the business too. So despite this group being the most dubious in the business um, and convinced it couldn't possibly work for them and that they were far too important and they were great big leadership roles, um, uh, their absence was, was going to be you know, detrimental to the business, I got 50% of this leadership team to agree to a trial of flexible working. And that group of people was made up of men and women, parents and non-parents. And it took us loads of really careful planning, some agile ways of working, really good communication, and unsurprisingly, some excellent IT facilities um, to make this work for us. They were all crucial elements for us. But most importantly, um, in a managerial role, I wanted to make it clear how important it was for their managers to continue to be really responsive to their teams, to be available and sensitive, to ensure that our really precious culture that we worked so hard on wasn't impacted by their lack of visibility. So at the end of the trial period, perhaps unsurprisingly, the managers saw the light and were like, this is amazing, this is awesome, I love it, and they're all still working flexibly. So we've got 50% of our leadership team are flexible workers at Rufus. Um, they've got a much greater level of trust in their teams and they've seen for themselves what the benefits are so now they really buy into this whole um, process and when a staff member comes to us now and asks for flexible working it's seen as a really positive step they've they've got a growing sense of confidence they're taking charge of their lives and also gives them more autonomy and people get a little bit more grown up and we're getting a and, and again, the other speakers have mentioned this, but dare I say it, people that work flexibly, you'll get more from them. They work more hours, they go the extra mile. I have to be careful not to say that in front of people that are working flexible, flexibly, but it's definitely something we've really noticed, and that figure of extra hours worked, I mean, that is so true in my experience. So my top tips for you, really, would be try not to be afraid of asking your staff what they want. It's not always that radical a change that people are asking for. And if you're in doubt, you can always do these things on a trial basis. In fact, none of the requests that we've had have been agreed to on anything other than a trial basis. We've always um, done the trial and we've never ever reneged on um, any of those uh, trials. So people have carried on their flexible working. I think it's also important that you don't look at this as a great big monster. Try not to bite off more than you can chew because a small bit of flexibility will go a long, long way for your staff. It means so much just to get that little bit of time back. Um, I would also suggest that in your, organi your organisation, you identify the blockers. In my, in my uh, organisation, I felt it was the management team. It may very well be different for you, a different group of people, those people perhaps that are not working part-time and their attitude to the workforce. 
Um, so to sum up, uh, I would say a year on, we've got a happier, more productive and engaged team at Rufus than ever before. And I've worked there for nearly 20 years. In fact, that picture you saw earlier was my uh, first day at Rufus. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't I aged well? No, other way. Um, okay, uh, the Sunday Times um, recently named Rufus in their top 100. Uh, we were actually 46th and I'm so proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that that is the best measurement that we can have to confirm that this change in our ways of working has had a really, really significant impact on engagement and loyalty in our business and our turnover is now 10% which as you will have seen from the, the figures stated at the beginning is absolutely fantastic. Um, and finally I'd just like to say that our flexibility has even extended to dogs and these are the Rufus dogs here. They're absolutely fabulous, they're a great addition to our workforce and even people with allergies love the dogs. <laughs> Um, but so what I would finish up to say is that if you're struggling with a flexible working policy for your staff, then you could always start with their pets first. Uh, that's it for me, so thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Conscious of time, I'm just going to uh, bring this quickly to conclusion and just well, give a quick run through of what NABS is doing to respond um, the NABS Working Parents Initiative um, now includes an extension of our programme and a number of you I think will be quite familiar with a lot of the work that we've been doing and I've mentioned our advice line, coaching and masterclasses. And in particular we're extending the services that we provide over the next few months and we've already started to do so, in particular making sure we're going to be there for the journey of parents. So certainly looking for pre-birth and also for older children. We've typically focused on women returners and we want to make sure that we're there for that journey of people's career through um, the their upbringing of their children. We've also extended our services up into Manchester and we're testing that and we've done testing some new webinars such as Fathering in the Fast Lane and as, as Pippa said making sure that we don't forget dads as part of this. I just want to say thank you to a few people before we all start to disappear out of the room. Um, I thank you for everybody here who's contributed to this report. We couldn't have absolutely done it without you and in particular to Karen, Pippa and Lucy today for your time and presenting this report. Um, I need to thank our co-authors um, for the report, Pooja Dabari here, who is a consultant um, and is now a business director at Salt Communications and an ex-colleague of mine from Bernardo's. Um, Annabelle McCaffrey, who is a senior advisor at NABS, has also worked extensively on this report, so thank you both. Um, but also my team, um, who have helped you all today, have worked tirelessly over the last few weeks. We had quite a lot of a platform at Adweek, which was brilliant. I don't know if anybody came to our events. Actually, I'm seeing familiar faces in the audience, so I know you did. And um, it's been really, really um, hard work to get this, get this going. So thank you all very much. Um, the other thing just to say is that we have our Stranger Than Summer Ball coming up um, in a, a, about just over a month's time. We've got four tables left. Um, I wouldn't be a fundraiser if I didn't stand here and say there is a last minute opportunity to get yourselves to the ball. It's going to be a 900 strong crowd with 90 or plus tables. And because we are fundraisers, if you want your coats back, the team are going to be selling raffle tickets so you can win a car. So actually, if, you, you know, if you're minded to help us that way, then please, please, that would be fabulous. So what can you do now? I just want to quickly say, here are the um, final recommendations. Just a quick reminder, those are, the, those are the four things. Please take those away. Please do what you can. Um, please implement them. Share your successes. We have a new online portal, which you can either send to us, and soon it will be live for you to act, update your own ideas. Let's keep sharing. Let's keep this moving, and let's make sure we champion the best practice across the industry and really make our organisation superb. We really want to be able to share the programme with the team. You've got the information there of what NABS is doing. Please share that with your teams. We are at the end of the phone, the end of the um, internet, just to simply get hold of us and come and work with us and get involved. And in particular, we're looking for some people who can join our mentoring group, who are experienced parents who've gone through some of this um, themselves. Not just senior people, everybody from across the organisation who can help others. If you're interested in being a mentor for NABS, then please, please let us know. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.